Hi everyone, welcome to this Data Innovators Masterclass. Uh, I'm Julian Redmond from Ignition. I have uh, two very special guests with me today. Uh, I guess the first one, proof that the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree, is my brother Sam. Hi Sam, how are you going? Very well, very well. Um, we might get you to introduce yourself considering you're probably a, a new face to this audience. Uh, maybe give us a little bit of your background. Certainly. Um, so uh, Sam Redmond, uh, the director of the ADAPT Group. Uh, ADAPT Group is an advisory um, across technology, strategy and innovation. Uh, my, my background uh, has been a circuitous path through technology, through deep tech, climate tech um, and through aerospace. Um, and today I'm working with companies, uh, helping them apply AI to identify where AI should be applied uh, and really to support them in their digital transformation endeavors. Great. And the other face, which is probably uh, familiar to some of this audience anyway, is uh, Richard Harris. Hey, Rich, good to see you again. Hello, um, so Richard is a previous colleague, current colleague, current partner, um, specializing in data privacy. Rich, give us the, the two minute spiel. Uh, yeah, so Data Design Consulting is who I am with, and uh, we specialize in privacy compliance when it comes to personal data with a specific focus on policies, uh, procedures, and uh, and culture. Yeah, which is, so obviously we've, we've dragged together a specialist in AI and a specialist in privacy, so it might be fairly clear what we're going to talk about today. Um, because there is a real clash here, I guess, you know, there is lots of stuff happening and lots of innovation happening very fast, but there is also, you know, regulatory compliance and that tightening of, of uh, privacy policies and, you know, and large breaches happening as well. So, so I wanted to dive into, I guess, how do these worlds collide and, and, you know, some of this is moving really quickly. So, uh, so, you know, feel free to speculate and, uh, or, or let us know what you know, and and also maybe call out where we don't know answers yet as well, because that's I think that's always interesting. So, I mean, for me, it probably starts with transparency and accountability. Um, you know, because yeah, I mean, how can AI systems you know be made more transparent in the way they collect data? You know, when most algorithms, you know, at least in my understanding, Sam, are uh, you know black boxes. Is it actually realistic to expect that there's going to be some sort of transparency in what sort of personal data is being accessed or or used to train a model? So we'll start with you on that one. Uh, yeah, look, it's um, we're straight down the rabbit hole. Uh, look, I think yeah. that uh, I think that part of the part of the understanding for the application of AI is is thinking about where we are today. So our existing regimes around data data use. Um, the culture of an organization around data, how data is reused across an organization, um, how it's harvested, all of those things are more than likely for most organizations not where they need to be. And, and AI is an accelerator for digital transformation. So it enables you to very rapidly digitally connect across your organization and to other data sets or other organizations and start delivering um, outcomes at speed. And so what it's probably going to do in the first instance is uh, uh, bring to the surface all of the inefficiencies, inadequacies you have in the um, management and execution of your your obligations as they stand today. And so I think that that's, if we understand that, then we sort of say, okay, so um, uh, when we start to embark on uh, deploying AI at an organisational level, then we need to simply just not have the assumption that our current process is effective and the current data that we have, we have rights to use in a certain way. And so I don't think this really sort of reaches into the work that Richard does. But I think that if you start with that premise, then you're more than likely not going to find yourself falling foul of your first implementation of, of AI. Um, so that's from an organisation perspective. When you think about the actual algorithms themselves and what they've been trained on, uh, they're probably the opaquest of technologies that we've developed today. Um, you now we talk about they've been trained on the corpus of human knowledge, you know, and so because they and now they're creating their own knowledge to try and actually train them um, even more. So I think that there's a that sort of you know um, uh, a, a much sort of more complex element to um, 
to talk to and it's and but it's a it's a key challenge for organizations to deal with and i think that that's for everybody to start with start with your own policies your own practices your own data and make sure that that's in order as you embark on ai yeah that's that's a good point because i guess if you're yeah adopting an llm you know or some sort of ai that's been trained on a on a set of data and that's probably a, a very wide very you know um, maybe publicly available set of data, but then you're going to apply your own business information to it to make it specific to your use case. So, Rich, the question I have for you then is who's responsible? When you start providing corporate information, you know, to specialise one of these AI solutions, you know, like you could be introducing unintended biases or sensitive mm -hmm. information. So is it the developer? Is it the company? Is it the regulator? Who's... Who's wearing responsibility around this stuff? And I suspect you don't really know. But Well, <clears throat> I think the important thing, and you use the word at the top of this sec section, accountability is, is the watchword here. Uh, ultimately, organisations are responsible for the information they collect and how it's used and protected. But accountability is not only about complying with regulations, it's about demonstrating how you comply with those regulations. So one of the things that we are expecting to happen in our privacy framework in the not too distant future, because it's already part of GDPR and CPRA and a number of other legislations around the world, is that when you're using personal information in what's classified as high risk or sensitive areas, um, then you use a privacy impact assessment. So I think the important thing is, if you're about to embark on a journey where you are going to apply artificial intelligence, and generally you're not just opening the floodgates and saying, let the AI loose and see what it will do, you, you, you're doing it in a developmental area. So you have that window of opportunity to actually, as an organization, go through a privacy impact assessment process. And there are a number of templates, but by and large, the process is, you set goals and objectives for the program of work. And in this case, you know, training an AI to have a certain outcome or make certain decisions. You're documenting that. You're trying to understand what a, what is the outcome or how am I going to measure that outcome to begin with. Then there's a process of mapping the data flows. So what information is going to flow into my organization? Where does it come from? How is it going to flow into this AI model? And potentially then what comes out of the back end of that? And then it's about going through a risk profile. Okay, what risks do I understand from a regulatory compliance standpoint? But then you also have organizational risk. You know, what if we make the wrong decision? What if those biases come through and we're making poor decisions on behalf of people based upon you know, data that has been generated by crusty 40-year-old white men for the last 50 years kind of thing. Then you've got the process, and again, this is collaborative. You have a number of stakeholders involved where you've said, okay, this is my privacy uh, risk. This is my uh, organizational risk. Here are the personal risks. So what risks might there be for the individuals in question? Then you have a discussion about how to mitigate those risks. So the privacy impact assessment is a way of bringing the organizational together, taking a step back. And, and the concept here is privacy by design, that before you go ahead and start building what you want, you're taking the time to think about what are the risk implications for what I'm about to do and how can I mitigate those risks? Now, some of those risks will be acceptable. Some of them you can mitigate and reduce, but not eliminate. Some of them you may be able to eliminate completely. So obviously one of the critical questions is, do I need PII as part of the training model? Can I just use de-identified data? Those are the kind of things. So I, I, I would suggest that there is no one person ultimately that should own this, but a privacy impact assessment will tell you who was consulted, who the stakeholders were and creates an environment whereby everybody can participate and highlight all the risks and how we can how we can mitigate them, and that is something I, I think it, it should become part of any organisational's DNA when they're about to embark on a new project. And if I can just add on the back of that, Richard, I think that it's to do that and then know that you have to keep evaluating even those algorithms and they've got deployed because that de-identified data 
what we're finding is these really advanced algorithms find patterns and through those patterns they can associate behavior and then it can actually precipitate back to the individual and so you have this exaggeration where you didn't look to actually capture pi and you end up with pi because undeniably you have the fingerprint of the individual and so you want the safeguards yeah. in if that's not what you want as an outcome because you know all these policies apply to business and government unless you're in the military and unless you're in defense or cyber etc and then all of them sort of go away if you're just a regular company and you're trying to steer clear of that then you need to constantly be evaluating what are the outcomes and what are the insights that you're getting because you may actually find yourself just step back over that bridge yeah and in fact uh, the template that i use most often when doing a pia actually has that section of are you using de-identified data is there a chance it can be re-identified and you're right the more sophisticated machines get at piecing together seemingly unrelated pieces of information the minute that you can use that to single out an individual you're now back into the realm of personal information so and also you know thank you for reminding me but it's not a set and forget document because the actions the things that you need to do take time and so having periodic reviews to say have we done these things have other things changed is kind of a a vital thing and it's one of those things that unfortunately yes you have to now bake into the cost of doing business that there is going to be time and resources applied to creating the impact assessment reviewing it and adapting accordingly um, the important thing is though often these documents are not designed to say you can't do something the documents are designed to say if you are going to do this thing then these are the things you need to have done in order to minimize risk to the organization and to any individuals whose data you're using. And should there be any issue, a complaint is made to the government agency or directly or whoever, now you have something to support to say, well, we thought about that. This is what we did. This is why we made the decision we did. And that is also a way of protecting the organization, not just the data or the individuals. So you guys have already asked and answered two more of my questions. So it's going to be the <laughs> easiest masterclass ever for me. Um, but that's really good. But wow, we dived straight into the meat of it all, didn't we? So I guess the, you know, the thought in my head, because, of, you know, potentially a lot of people listening to this are, you know, data engineers or architects who are trying to grapple with this stuff. And, you know, my, my thought, I guess, is how do you, how can a user truly provide informed consent to use their data if they don't even understand the model that it's going into or you know or or they say no but they're going to get inferred anyway so sam are there any like practical steps for kind of starting an ai project that you know where you can dip your toe in the water but you can you know obviously richard's talked about doing the privacy impact assessment and and understanding what's being there are there any other steps from the the technology side that you can kind of do to limit your exposure yeah and look i think that it will it will stomp right into richard's area and then come back out again and he can add to it but look i think in part you need to start with intent so what is the intent of the um of this digitization then you're going to be using ai as a tool and so if you if you're really clear about your intent then you can step back and say well what is the information what are the facts what is the data that i require in order to deliver the outcome that aligns with that intent and then there is that would then be a proposition for a customer or a client if you um, are willing to share this data in this way for this purpose we can deliver this outcome and so imagine an insurer and an insurer simply just says we know that our actua actuarial models can be more accurate and lead to a lower premium if you're willing to share this information um, and these are here are the caveats, etc. But it's only going to be used in that way. Then you have give the user the ability to provide that information, so the model can actually be more specific on you as an individual or as a household or property to um, then get a better outcome. Then when you build that data set, then you need to flag that that data is only consumable in that workflow, which means now you think you've got to set up all of your guardrails around your, your data and the access to that data and who, who uses that access to get to that data, et cetera. And so in order to persist trust, you need to build it in at the data level. So you understand 
what that data is and how it's accessed, et cetera. And then you need to make sure those guardrails flow into the AI and into those workflows. And so I think if you if you start in that way, then you are going to be much clearer with the customer on why they might want to um, share that information in that way. They've probably already shared most of it. You're just asking it for it to be used in that way. Um, and you're um, you're offering them some value, so there's consideration. Arguably, the only reason we collect this data is so we can form a contract between a company, a company and a consumer or a user. You are simply just asking for a new contract to actually deliver a different outcome and then make sure that the technology and the guardrails sit around that purpose. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, because there's obviously people, you know, there's a there's always that that traditional concern of like, well, especially with an insurance company, if I share you know, my health data, does it mean that I'm going to be discriminated against? And I know there's laws in place and those sorts of things, but you just, you do wonder. I know there's obviously a level of comfort with sharing certain information. And then, you know, a lot of people have a very hard wall around, you know, what else they want to share. Um you know, have you, Rich, have you done work with, uh, you know, with, um, oh, I'm sure you have, where there's lots of consumer or patient or health data or, you know, or, or um, financial services, you know, where there is, there's lots of really sensitive data and, and, you know, and coming up with those, those different classifications of how you actually say, well, yes, you can use this for your base stuff and then this next bit for, for these processes and, you know, and I'm hierarchy of that. What I would say is, uh, listening to Sam's response there, is he's kind of helped highlight one of the big challenges. There's lots of technical terms in the world of AI and machine learning. And when you use words like, you know, guardrails and also, most people out there are going to get lost. In fact, there was uh, some research released just recently about if someone were to read all of the privacy policies that they would have to in the course of their day, it comes out of like weeks of their year would be spent reading nothing but privacy policies. So you've kind of hit the nail on the head. How do we facilitate an informed consent here? So for me, it comes back to how you write your privacy policy or you make it your uh, in your collection statements because the average person is who we're writing these policies for. And the average person, I like to use the example of, of my mother-in-law, who refers to Google Chrome as the internet. And that's about as far as her technical understanding goes. She's naturally nervous about sharing certain types of information. So I think that the trick here is think about the artificial intelligence as another person with whom you are disclosing information to in your privacy policies, because that's all AI is. It's emulating human decision making. It does it faster, sometimes a lot better, more efficiently and more accurately. But if we start off on that, then we can in our policies make statements along the lines of we do use your information to facilitate automated decision making or just making decisions using you know, machine learning or whatever term you might end up using. But it's about explaining it in plain language. Now, your information is used in order to make a determination about A, B, or C, and these are the, you know, these are the criteria. And explicitly, these are the things that we will not do with your information, and these are the rights you have over the information, and making sure that if someone has more questions, they've got a phone number they can use or an email address that they can use to make contact. And I cannot stress this enough, make sure those phone numbers and those emails are monitored and you're responding in a timely fashion. I cannot tell you how many times it sits there in an in inbox that someone maybe checks every two weeks. No, if, if someone's concerned, you want to be able to demonstrate trust and therefore being responsive, answering questions, providing a lot more, you know, providing that extra detail, being open and back to that idea of transparency. So I don't think you can realistically explain all the nuances of what data is used, how the algorithm works, what weighting is given to what kind of information, etc. People are not going to read it or understand it. They just want a plain language explanation of when you give us your personal information, one of the things we're going to do with it 
is to uh, make a decision in financial services parlance of, you know, will you qualify for a loan? Um, we won't use this information for direct marketing or other purposes. If you have any questions, contact us here. It's, does it sound like we need a, a large language model to read all these privacy statements for us? Is that well, yeah, maybe a... I was, I was going to say there's two <laughs> things that I think come from what Richard said. One is he mentioned the word trust and you could have an entire masterclass just on trust because that's the biggest issue that we have here is that the, that the populace have a lack of trust and organisations need to act with trust and they need to have, they need to be trusted by the populace and they need to be trusted by the regulators and they're, and they're two different conversations. What Richard spoke about was plain English, making it really clear for the user, but then it goes to the algorithm. They need to tell the regulator, no, here is how the algorithm works. Here is how it doesn't have bias. You know, we know that um, the CCTVs in camera have a bias to darker coloured skin. They can't see emotions as well. All of the LED upgrades we've been doing around the world to try and drive efficiency start in the ultraviolet and then go through uh, phosphorus to actually become a white light. They don't render colour and emotion as well in darker skin. So suddenly you have a situation where you've got cameras with a bias, lights with a bias, algorithm has a bias. And so the regulators want to understand how are your algorithms actually being fair across the populace, but the populace just want to say, can I trust you? Did you say something that I can comprehend? And I think that, so if you take that, you say, yes, I think part of the situation is I'm going to call up and I'm going to have my Jarvis AI. Why? Because we're getting really good at compressing the algorithms down and it's going to help me ask questions and it's going to help me interpret answers. And it's probably going to be talking to a chatbot at the other end, which understands all the policies of that company and can answer a whole bunch of the questions. And and we're both going to be using AI to try and um, communicate, you know, and communication is where the intent and the impact align, yeah? I say something, what you understood is the same thing. These assistive AIs are going to help in that communication back and forward. And so I think that's just an inevitable future where all organisations do it because it's efficient and it's, an, it's effective and they can be far more responsive and they can be really clear with the customer base. The customer base is probably going to get armed the same way. Yeah. All right. I want to shift gears into, uh, so Sam, you and I've had plenty of chats around access control, which obviously, you know, makes you think about data breaches and security breaches and those sort of things. So, um, you know, let's maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, what's, what's sort of happening there around thinking about access control, especially in the agentic workflow kind of space. Um, cause then Rich, I want to talk about like, what do you do when you have a breach and what are the impacts of that so, so maybe yeah. start with the start with the the you know what we, what's what's happening and what are the potential risks yeah so if we if we if we just talk um start with agentic workflow so the idea of of having a number of agents which like form as individuals with specific personas you know might have a a data scientist and then a software developer and then a test engineer and then a quality um a reliability engineer and their ability to set up a an agentic or a cross-functional team and then have um, pass off activities to one another and be able to then be recursive and run back. And so it's great. You have this um, set of AI capabilities that can work autonomously. And then the question is, well, who kicked off the process and under what privilege is that process running? And that, so I think a key question is when you're designing these is you say, right, you need to then have structure around the data. So you have access and privilege around the data and then um, you need to say, right, um, what kicks off the process and there needs to be a privilege around that process. Is it an individual who engage, engages with the process, which means therefore it, in, it should inherit my permissions and that is how it acts through the organisation. I get, don't get access to that data. Why? Because I'm a, I'm a graduate who's just got employed and I'm not allowed to see that data. Or it's a business process, in which case you then need to be able to create a persona for that business process that therefore has specific privilege as well. So that then when you build this agentic team, it acts with the right privilege on, on controlled data sets. And, and if you, and so that's, that's sort of what you need to set in place. Otherwise you'll end up with um, data sets that will um, answer questions um, that they may not have, um, they will answer questions with data that they were never able, should never have had access to, and therefore provide information to users that should never have been able to get an answer to that question. Um, and and so that's 
that's the the challenge that you you faced. It's not insurmountable. It's just a, a structured layered approach. Yeah, and we've always locked stuff down by you know I guess the type of user you know so. And DBAs can do certain functions, and and business analysts can do other functions, and certain people can look at, you know, HR people can look at HR data, for instance, you know, um, and uh, and it seems now that you're going to have these agent teams that have access to a lot of data potentially, they need to carry through that that you know authentication and you know profile of the person actually at the end kicking off the request, but it does feel like there is definitely um uh. You know, with, with, if you don't focus on that, you have the potential for creating a scenario where you've got some sort of uh, uh, access point. And so, Rich, we've had lots of lots of data breaches over the last few years of of alarming size, um, and they're the ones that get all the headlines. But I'm sure there's thousands that are not quite of that same size that just go by. You know, I, I mean, lots of people talk about you know brand risk and those sorts of things. What's the yeah, you know, what's the situation uh, for you know, for organisations when you know when they they have one of these sorts of events? Well, <clears throat> I mean, we operate um, under the notifiable data breach scheme, which is why we see so many of these breaches. And of course, the media is getting far more educated about what they mean and the implications. So. Um, which ultimately I think is a good thing. I mean, as much as it's heartbreaking to see all these breaches, it provides a very visceral reminder for organisations to to take these things very seriously. And certainly the new uh, penalties that are being uh, proposed as part of the recent uh, bill to amend the Privacy Act um, certainly give the um, OAIC uh, a much bigger stick to wield. Uh, when it comes to that. And we're already seeing quite a lot of attention being placed on you know, reassessing what risks people are willing to take. So when it comes to the data breach in general, what you're trying to do uh, is, first of all, try and understand how did that breach occur? What information has been breached? And what are the implications both to the organisation and again, to the individual for that information being um, released. And, you know, you can have a breach where someone accesses the information and then issues a ransom demand. Now, whether or not you choose to pay that ransom is still a matter of debate. I think the government have their point of view. I think major or share-driven organisations may have a slightly different point of view. Um, but nonetheless, you, you have a, a process that is relatively straightforward and, and well mapped out. In the world of artificial intelligence, though, I think one of the, the benefits of artificial intelligence is, again, you're removing the human error. The vast majority of data breaches that occur do so because of human error people either not following policies or procedures, or maybe there weren't procedures in place, people left to their own devices about how to do things. So AI does what you tell it to do. It doesn't all of a sudden decide, oh, I'm going to go and poach some data from that system there that I didn't have access to, or I'm going to, you know, have a whole new idea about how business is going to be done. It's very well controlled. We don't live in the world of generalized AI. AIs are very smart, but they're very smart about a very narrow set of things you're asking it to do, albeit you might then chain them together. So for me, I, I think that that becomes one of the uh, benefits of looking at artificial intelligence and where we can deploy artificial intelligence for business process optimization, for decision making, for even the handling of, of information. Because the less we can put personal information into the hands of an individual, more so that risk profile probably declines. So for me, I, I think you know that's where in a world where information can get hacked, breached and so forth, that the use of AI and limiting which systems and who has access to those systems that actually contain meaningful PI is probably a, a good thing uh, at yeah. the end of the day. Um, I think because, you, you yeah, privacy again, by design. 
Um, yes, and, and, and again, <laughs> most most um, algorithms, most uh, learning models don't necessarily need the PII, the personal identity information. What they're interested in is the patterns of behavior. And in fact, in many cases, removing some of those elements in itself might help to take some of the ethical bias out. Like when we see um, CVs, we know that when you remove someone's age, gender and name, you get a lot fairer decisions off the back of that. And so if you remove some of those data points that sometimes inherently drive a bias or, 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 what, or what have you, you may end up getting a better result anyway. There's a, a few of you know, people in the industry and I have an ongoing discussion, particularly in the data warehousing space of give me a reason when you need PII in a data warehouse. And we've yet to find really a, a compelling reason to do so because everything can be done at an aggregate behavioral level and then you can take those outputs and say, oh, how do I then apply that back to an individual after I have used that model to make a decision or what have you? And I think I think that's the thing. You want, you know, as a consumer, you want uh, you want um, the company to not store your data for, your data for any purposes that you haven't given permission for, but you also want them to treat you like you're a you know you're a regular or a local, you know, you want to walk in the bar and they'll go norm, you know, like an old cheers reference. So, you know, like, I think there is that expectation to be treated like an individual. Uh, and to do that, companies need to do certain things. So they need to strike that balance. And I think that's, you know, that's a real kind of key message is, if you're doing privacy by design, you know, as Sam was explaining, there's already some really good approaches to manage, you know, the way you structure the the initial project, uh, you know, doing program to understand your privacy um, implications and, and what data you're dealing with, and uh, then do privacy by design from the start um, and you know, manage your access control and all those sorts of things. So, look, I've got questions here on on uh, the ethical side, on managing you know things like children's data, on GDPR, a whole bunch of things. We're already a half an hour in, so we're, we're not going to draw this out to be an hour and a half masterclass. Um, so maybe just some final thoughts, uh, Sam, maybe to start with just, and I think probably pr from a just a practical perspective, if most people are starting their first AI initiative or in their first set of AI initiatives, you know, what's the advice? Do you target something that goes nowhere near privacy? You know, like what, what are you seeing? How are people kind of tackling this? So look, I think that... Uh... The, the first application of AI should be the highest value application of AI in your business. And so part of the um, work that I do is actually um, use AI to ingest information about your business, your strategy, your market, the way that you work, et cetera, try and work out. It's just a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a multi-tool and there's lots of them, but what is the highest value application? And value is a function of, you know, the erosion that you'll get from risk and non-compliance as well. And so you will, unless you have a really high value um, uh, part of your workflow that deals with PI, but it's, you know, it's consuming an enormous amount of cost in your business, it's unlikely to be the first cab off the rank. Um, but if it is, the, the stack of value will be so high that it will warrant the time and effort to invest in making sure that all those safeguards are in place. And so I think it should be treated in that way. You, you don't look to apply AI in your business. You look to um, address opportunities and risks and the challenges in your business and use AI as an enabler to get there. Um, I think uh, I think that there is, there is reason to be wary about it because... Uh, how it's implemented it can if you if you want to give it autonomy within your business in a workflow um then it's only going to behave as well as we define the parameters in which it um will behave with it and we've proven that humans are the the issue in this loop you know the ais will do exactly as we ask it to do and say oh, i didn't want it to do that but that's what i asked it to do and so i think that it's we just need to you want to go for not too complex high value to begin with and then build your competencies over time yeah, perfect. Rich, any final thoughts as a starting point from the... Um, I'll kind of tack on a little bit to what Sam said in that there's an adage that says 
Uh, every system is perfectly designed to achieve the outcomes it's delivering. And if you're getting bad outcomes, then it's the system that's been designed incorrectly. And so particularly in the world of data and when you've got so many people involved in how information flows, how it's used, one of the biggest things I think people can do is to start looking at issues at a systemic level. Take out the individual blame because if people are worried that, oh, God, I've made a mistake in my code and it's now caused this big disaster, oh, dear, I'm going to lose my job, then they're less likely to come forward. Whereas if they're in an environment where they feel encouraged to say, I stuffed up here, guys, then we can have a systemic review to say, how do we prevent that from happening in the future? Is there another audit step or another review step that we can use? Because that's one of the things that makes most teams the most successful is that idea of trust, that I know I'm in a safe environment, I can share, okay, I've made a mistake, how do we fix that at a systemic level? And I think that holds true here as well, is that you know, people wanting to use artificial intelligence, there's so many reasons to do so, but we've got to get to a point where we realize if we're getting a bad outcome, um, even when it comes down to that data breach, you go back to, well, what was wrong with our system that resulted in that being possible to begin with? And that's that would be my big thought, my my big recommendation is to don't point the finger, don't hold any individual responsible. Ultimately, the organization is accountable. It is the systems, processes, policies, procedures that are in place that ultimately are going to deliver that 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 breach if it happened. So yeah. that's the level I would elevate the conversation to. Isn't it isn't it amazing that even as everything moves on, systems thinking and you know and diligent detailed design is still the the important things uh to make sure mm -hmm. that these things are successful so the, the, but, the i was gonna the last bit around that is it is mm -hmm. um the regulators need to be adopting this as fast as they can so they can try mm -hmm. and keep pace with the innovation that's in the market and that's that's of the real dilemma that we're in is that regulation has been slow and a laggard um, and it can't afford to be in this circumstance. It actually needs to keep pace with the industry, which means it needs to be deploying AI at the speed of industry. I think it's, that's yeah. That's I mean, and there's, yeah, and there's such a challenge with that. Like if you get into the whole deep fakes sphere and all of those sorts of things, yeah, you know, where there's zero regulation yet, you know, like obviously there's yeah, there, there's a, a lot to be done from that side to to catch up with where innovation's at. But well, that sounds like another week, two or three uh, masterclasses. Yeah. Um, last week, California updated the definition of personal information in their regulations to cover neural data, because there's now devices that will read brainwave activities through non-invasive means. Um, so, you know, that, that, that technology is already with us. And yeah, we've got no regulation covering it right now. So yeah. we've got more challenges to come for sure. Absolutely. That's All right, we're going to leave it there. No. <laughs> all other masterclass indeed yeah all right guys thank you very much thank for that. You i all. think it's great having both of you who you know clearly specialize in in uh aligned areas but very different areas and there's you know there's a real coming together of these these two aspects at the moment i think uh, it's a really interesting uh conversation um and obviously if anyone who is actually listening to this wants to get in touch with either of you then you know you can definitely do that through the community uh through ignition we we've, we've obviously partnered with with uh, both these guys and uh, keen to help and and make the connections um or obviously you both can be very easily found on uh, linkedin and other things as well so thanks for joining today i really appreciate it and uh and we'll chat again very very soon i guess thanks yes thanks julian